Let's take a look at digestive system control. Like most everything else in the body, it's regulated by nervous and endocrine systems. We soon look at nervous system a little, and we're going to look at some chemical signals too. When it comes to nervous system regulation, go back to the autonomic nervous system. Remember, that involves all the things in the body that are automatically controlled without your conscious thought. That's most of the structures in your body. You got those three divisions to the autonomic, which are sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric. Now, the sympathetic division tends to inhibit everything in the digestive system. The parasympathetic tends to stimulate it. But then you've got this third division called the enteric, which involves the neurons inside the digestive system. So these have much greater control of everything in this system. And largely what they're controlling is the movement of all this muscle and also the secretions of all those glands. But when we get to the chemical regulation, we'll see a few hormones we haven't looked at before, like gastrin and secretin. See a lot of these when we get to stomach and intestine. And also see some paracrine chemical signals like histamine. But let's look back at the peritoneum, something you've probably seen discussed before in your anatomy book. When you look inside this peritoneum, like other body cavities, you've got two layers, visceral and parietal. Remember, the inner visceral layer is always the surface of an organ. If you look at something like the surface of your stomach, well, that's the inner visceral layer in this case. The inner wall of your abdomen would be the outer parietal. That's what's around it. And of course, in between these visceral and parietal layers, you always have, always have your serous fluid, which reduces friction and helps to hold the organs in place. But remember, not everything in this abdominal pelvic cavity is inside that peritoneum. So that's what we call retro, retro meaning behind or outside, retro peritoneal organs. In your kidneys, pancreas, and duodenum are just a few of those. But in some places, these visceral and parietal layers run together and form mesenteries. These make pathways for blood vessels and nerves going to all these structures and organs. If you ever open up that abdominal cavity on maybe an animal or something, hold up those intestines, you can see these mesenteries binding and holding them together. <clears throat> a few of these mesenteries have proper names, like the greater omentum, and it runs from the greater curvature of the stomach to the transverse colon. We'll see all those structures further along. The lesser omentum, going from the lesser curvature of the stomach down largely to the liver and diaphragm muscle. And also on the surface of that liver, you can see some ligaments. These are remnants of old umbilical arteries and veins. The coronary and falciform are just a few of those. we we'll go back to the oral cavity and look at all the structures we have here. Like first the lips, the Latin word for that is labia, if you ever hear that. To the very rear of the oral cavity, where it meets the pharynx, which is your throat, is an opening called the fauces. But we also have a little bit more anterior, these vestibules, these spaces between the lips and cheeks. You'll find the alveolar processes there. That's those little sockets that your teeth fit down into. You can actually feel those on your mandible and maxilla if you run your fingers over them right there. Looking inside our oral cavity, there's definitely a stratified squamous epithelial layer there. Of course, in our skin, it's keratinized, but on the inside of these passageways that open to the outside of the body, it's going to be moist. And it better be many layers. There's lots of potential damage and abrasion could happen in the oral cavity as we chew. So you definitely would not want a single layer. But you sometimes hear about in the oral cavity this term tongue-tied. Now, if you look below your tongue, medially, just to the center there, you can see this little piece of tissue binding and holding it to your mandible. That's what's called the lingual frenulum. Sometimes it extends too far to the tip of the tongue and inhibits the tongue when somebody tries to speak. That's where the word tongue-tied comes from. Lipid-soluble drugs are often placed beneath the tongue. If you get up close to a mirror and look under your tongue, you can see blood vessels. There's a very thin epithelial layer there surrounding those blood vessels. So you can get a lipid-soluble drug into your blood very quickly by placing it there. We can also go back to your lips and cheeks. Of course, these are involved with mastication, the process of chewing and speech. There again to the lips or the labia, as we said before. Your orbicularis oris muscle, sort of that muscle runs around your lips. Whenever you like pucker or something, you're contracting that muscle there. And of course, to the outside, you've got keratin, that hard protein you saw back in a previous chapter in the stratified squamous layer. We've got the labial, labial frenula, 
And again, these bind the lips. If you look medially right to the center of them, you can see them binding them to the alveolar processes. Lots of facial muscles, which have been covered before. And then what we think of as our cheeks is larger that buccinator muscle and sometimes an accumulation of adipose tissue too. But looking back at things like the palate, you've got two of them, hard and soft. Now, if you put your tongue up on the roof of your oral cavity, you can feel bone. That's the hard palate. These bones are found more anterior to the front. Most of that's your maxilla, but to the back of that hard palate is a small palatine bone. But then back behind all of that is the soft palate. Now, that's skeletal muscle. If you go to the very back of your oral cavity while looking in a mirror, you can also see the uvula, which hangs right off the center of it. That soft palate can flip up and down. Whenever we swallow food or drink, it flips up so that stuff can't go up towards your nasal cavity. When you breathe in air, you need to flip down. That way it can come from your nasal cavity, down your pharynx, and so on down the line. But again, the uvula is what you see hanging right off the very center of that soft palate. And of course, you look to the very rear of your oral cavity in a mirror, you can see the palatine tonsils to the back. Looking at your tongue, that skeletal muscle, you know that it's got to be because you can control it with your conscious thought. There's a lot of muscle there. Now, there's two different groups of muscles. There are groups, there's a group of muscles inside of it called the intrinsic. They're more about changing the shape of the tongue. Or the extrinsic muscles outside of it are more about moving it around. And again, you've got a stratified squamous epithelial layer on the surface of the tongue. We mentioned the lingual frenulum before. And if you look up under your tongue right in the center, you can see it, binding it to the inferior surface beneath it. There's a sulcus, which is a groove about two thirds of the way to the back. On the front part and here, we had all these papillae. <clears throat> Those were covered in a previous chapter. And to the back, not so many, but we do have the lingual tonsils to the rear of the tongue there. And of course, we use the tongue if we want to move food around. Think about whenever you're chewing food, you're always using your tongue to move the food in between your teeth so you can grind it up. And of course, you use it with speech and swallowing too. But looking back at our teeth, there are two sets. Now, the first set may be called the primary, the deciduous, or the milk. That's the first set of teeth you have. We want to look more at the permanent or secondary set. So most adults are going to have 32 teeth. Now, that's going to be 16 in your maxilla, 16 in your mandible. But if you take your upper and lower jaw and cut them in half right in the center, then that gives you four quadrants, two upper quadrants and two lower quadrants. So if you look in each of those four quadrants, right to the very front, you find two incisors. And then right behind it is that sharp, pointy canine tooth. Those teeth there are used for biting and tearing. Think about if you take a bite out of a sandwich, you can see an impression left by these teeth. But after you bit it off, you move it to these teeth in the back, the premolars and molars, and those are used for grinding and chewing the food up. So again, in each one of the four quadrants, there are two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. Multiply each of those numbers by four, tells you how many you've got total in your oral cavity. So again, you use these with mastication primarily here. Looking at a tooth, you've got the anatomic crown. That's that enamel-covered part. The clinical is the section of the tooth above the gum line. you got the neck. It's a little bit deeper. It's a constricted, narrow part below the gum line. The enamel is very important. That is an outer, non-living portion of the tooth. If you ever lose that, it's not coming back. So you don't want to be losing that in any way. The dentin is the deeper, inner, living part of the tooth. If you get infection or damage in that region, if you'll know it, it'll be painful. You got the pulp cavity filled with blood vessels, nerves. You got the periodontal ligaments, which hold and bind our teeth down into the alveolar processes. Those are just dense, regular collagen arrangements. Collagen is very strong, good for binding and holding that stuff together. And the gingiva is what you think of as your gums. A lot of dense collagenous connective tissue there and a stratified squamous epithelial layer on the surface. But going back to the process of chewing, what mastication is right there. Again, the incisors and canines tear off the food and then the prelip molars and molars grind it up. You got eight muscles involved with chewing, four on the right and four on the left side of your head there. 
you want to elevate that mandible. That's what you really think of as biting and chewing there. The temporalis muscles over the temporal bone, the masseter in each side of your cheek, left and right, and then the medial pterygoids all assist with this. When you think about depressing the mandible, opening your mouth up, that's the lateral pterygoids. But we can also use these pterygoids and masseters <clears throat> for this lateral and medial excursion. That's the side to side grinding action. Think about when you chew like a piece of meat on those rear molars and such. That's when you grind side to side. And all this chewing reflex can be controlled by the medulla oblongata, but since it's skeletal muscle, you can also control it with your conscious thought. And after you've chewed food up, added some saliva to it, and moistened it, then it's called a bolus at that time. But inside here in the oral cavity, we've also got these three pairs of salivary glands. So there's six of them total. You got the large parotids. Those are a little bit anterior and a little bit lower than your ears right there. They have a large duct comes out around that second upper molar there. You got the submandibular deep, in other words, under your mandible right there with ducts coming out on either side of the lingual frenulum. You can see those a little bit if you look under your tongue in the mirror. And then the sublingual under your tongue here. Lots of ducts coming out in the floor of the oral cavity for those. And of course, you get all these lingual glands associated with them. Looking back at all this saliva, we produce about one to one and a half liters a day. And they talk about this preventing bacterial infection. Primarily how they do this is by washing bacteria out of the oral cavity. There's probably a small amount of lysosomes that helps to kill them, but the constant washing, swallowing, is primarily what does it. Swallow those bacteria, take them down to your stomach, and stomach acid to kill about anything. The saliva definitely helps to moisten and soften the food for lubrication as you swallow it. We see our first enzyme appearing here, salivary amylase. And you're an enzyme with amylase in the name. It's going to break down your carbs, talking about your sugars there. Again, it helps to form the bolus, which you call chewed food. And of course, this is under parasympathetic control. Somebody gets nervous and the sympathetic division is activated. The mouth gets dry, just opposite. The parasympathetic stimulates that saliva production there. So again, that's a lot. One to one and a half liters being produced every day. So, of course, we don't have much in this picture. We see some of the teeth. There's the tongue. Here's your hard palate. There's your soft palate. And that uvula be hanging right off the bottom of it right there. And then, of course, we're going to get to pharynx and other structures a little bit further along.